Anything that you specify on a page directive will apply to the entire JSP page. It normally doesn't matter where in the source code you place the page directive, it always applies to the entire file. You can use the page directive as many times as you like in a JSP page, but you can only use each attribute of the page directive once. The exception to this is the import attribute, which you can use any number of times. You can specify the language used in the scriptlets with the language attribute setting like this. So far, the only valid language is Java, and that's the default, so there's no real need to use this attribute. The translator converts the JSP code into a Java class. The default in the version of J2EE that I have is for it to extend the class named HTTP JSP base like this. If you have need to change that, you can by using the page directive. For example, you could have your class extend the vector class with this command. But be careful about doing this. Look up the default superclass in the API documentation and make certain that you won't be giving up something that you need. You can use the page directive to generate import statements in the class. This is the one attribute that you can use over and over. Or you can generate more than one import statement from a single page directive by separating the names by commas like this. You can specify the full path name or you can use the asterisk notation. Any form that could be used on a Java import command can be used here. In the previous examples for this course, there were no import statements. If you always use the full package name of the classes, you never need to use an import statement. Now, some packages are implicitly imported, so you don't need to import them in your code. As usual, the Java Lang package is always imported, but in JSP code, some other packages are imported automatically as well. These three lines of code are always inserted at the top of the generated code. Almost every class in every package that begins with the names JVAX.servlet is included. By the way, there is one minor limitation here. You must place the import directive in the source file before the imported class or package is actually used. The Java language was designed with the idea in mind that the import statements would always go up at the top. If you want to be able to track the session, you will need to have a session object, which you will not have if you do this. Of course, true is the default. If you don't do anything, every user will have a session object and will set cookies. If you're not going to be using the session object, you don't need it. So you can set this directive to false and it won't be there. You can save some overhead when people visit the website because it doesn't instantiate a session object for every visitor and it doesn't generate cookies. You can set the size of the buffer that's used by the out object to write the HTML code to the generated page. The default is 8K. This is a matter of efficiency tuning. You can set it to whatever size you would like or you can just turn it off. The auto flush setting is sort of an odd one. It's a boolean setting and its default is true. I don't know exactly why or when you would want to set it otherwise. This determines whether the buffered output should be flushed automatically when the buffer is full from writing to out. If it's set to true, the buffer will be flushed to the output. If it's set to false, an exception will be thrown when the buffer overflows. This specifies whether thread safety has been included in your code. If you have it set to true, you must write your code in the JSP page to synchronize the multiple client threads. If you set it to false, the JSP container sends client requests one at a time to the JSP page. Your code doesn't have to be careful about thread safety. The default is true, so generated code is considered to be thread safe and will be unless the code you add is not thread safe. The info tag lets you specify a string of text that is accessible from inside the program. This string of text will be incorporated into the compiled JSP page 
and you can retrieve the text inside your JSP page by calling the GetServlet.info method. You can write pages that are displayed to the user whenever an error occurs, and you can specify the path name of the error page with this directive. You place the URL of the page on the local server inside the quotes. If there is an error attempting to display this page, the page specified by the URL is displayed instead. It can be the name of a local file or a file on a local subdirectory. If you begin the URL name with a slash, the path is relative to the JSP application documentation root directory and is resolved by the web server. If this page is to be used as an error page, this Boolean value must be set to true. The default is false, so if you're not writing an error page, there's nothing you need to do. If this is set to true, you'll be able to use the exception object which is thrown by the page that's in error. This directive can be used to set the MIME type and the character encoding of the response page. This example shows the default. If this is what you want, you don't need to do anything. You can use any MIME type and character sets that are valid for the JSP container. That's it for the page directive. Well, that's it for the version of J2EE that I have here in front of me. But there are almost certainly to be new attributes and options added to it as time goes by. If you don't find what you need here, check the documentation that applies to your version and you may find it there.